Hi, this is Chris Young. Welcome to episode 17 of Contemplating Your Life. This week we continue our series of episodes on my experiences growing up in a special education school. We talked about my experiences in fourth and fifth grade and how I began to develop a passion for math and science. When I was in third grade, Ms. Holmes was assisted by a student teacher named Mr. Wright. I don't recall his first name, if I ever knew it. After doing his student teaching at Roberts, he was hired the following year to teach fourth grade. So he was already familiar with me and all the other students. He was a really fun guy. For example, for social studies class, he made up some sort of play or pageant that was supposed to illustrate Central or South American native culture. I don't recall if he said it was Aztec or Incan or Mayan. I mentioned that in Ms. Holmes' class, I was sort of the teacher's favorite, and that continued under Mr. Wright. So I got to play the part of the tribal king. The queen was played by a girl named Rosemary. Now, those of you who know me have heard me talk about a girlfriend named Rose, but this was a different one. I vaguely recall referring to Rose as my girlfriend, but I think it was along the same lines as Cheryl from kindergarten. When you're in school, your family requires you to have a girlfriend, so I picked her. I don't even recall if she referred to me as her boyfriend. It may have just been someone I picked to keep my grandmother off my back, asking me about girlfriends. It wasn't that I had any particular attraction to her, except she was probably the second smartest person in the class, and then also a teacher's favorite. She moved away after the fourth grade, and I never saw her again. I didn't particularly miss her. At least I don't have any embarrassing stories to tell about insulting her disability, like I did with Cheryl. Fourth grade was the first class where we had a science class. That's where I began to get my passion for science, beyond my interest in the space program, which was at its height in the 1960s. We did experiments where we would pass light to a prism, and we showed how when you stick a pencil in a glass of water, the refraction makes it look like the pencil is broken. I think we also played around with batteries, light bulbs, motors, and switches, as well as electromagnets. It was in the fourth or perhaps fifth grade that I began reading science fiction. The first book I had was Tom Swift and His Rocket Ship, closely followed by Danny Dunn and the Anti-Gravity Paint. I'll talk more about my passion for science fiction and these books in particular in a later episode. Beyond the science experiments and crazy plays that we acted out in Mr. Wright's class, I also recall he was a huge fan of James Bond. This was the 1964-65 school year, which saw the release of From Russia with Love and Goldfinger, starring Sean Connery. I don't know if it was Mr. Wright's influence or I just got caught up in Bond fever, but I recall I built a model car that was a James Bond Aston Martin complete with a spring-loaded ejection seat and rockets that would shoot out the back when you press a button. I remember having some deep philosophical discussions with him, well, to the extent that a nine-year-old could, because I had difficulty with the idea that the double O in 007 meant license to kill. I didn't think even with a government license it was okay to kill somebody. My only other memory of Mr. Wright was that he had gone to school in Terre Haute, Indiana, and he'd convinced us that the words Terre Haute were an Indian phrase meaning terrible smell. It was only when I took French in high school I learned that it meant high ground in French. One more very memorable thing happened in fourth grade. There was a girl named Rita Johnson in my class. She had braces on her legs and walked using Canadian crutches. 
Those are sort of like a cane that has part of it come up into a U-shaped cuff that goes around your forearm. Your crutch doesn't come all the way up to your armpit like traditional crutches. She was walking by my desk one day and slipped and fell. The cuff around her forearm dug into her arm and cut a V-shaped slice into it, about three-quarters of an inch. A flap of skin opened up from this V-cut, and you could see what I thought was muscle inside her arm. I don't know for certain that's what I was seeing, but it was definitely a deep cut all the way through the skin. It wasn't just a scrape. Like lots of kids with crutches and braces, falling down wasn't that unusual. She was about to attempt to get up when she looked down at her arm and saw the wound. She started screaming hysterically. They just flopped that flap of skin closed, took her to the nurse's office, wrapped it up in a bandage, and sent her back to class. I think the thing really needed stitches, but I don't think she ever got any. Years later, when I was in my early 20s, I ran into her at a disability event, and she still had a V-shaped scar on her arm. Unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to talk to her and tell her I remembered the day she got it. Afterwards, I bragged to everybody about what I saw. It was so cool. You could actually see inside her arm. Wow. All the girls thought it was gross, and all the guys thought it was so cool. They were jealous that I got to see it, and they didn't. This incident further provoked my sense of scientific curiosity. Who knows, had I not been disabled, it might have led me to a career in medicine. My scientific curiosity was piqued by other observations around that age. We used to go to the Lafayette Road drive-in movie at the corner of Lafayette Road and Georgetown Road. We had a 1959 Plymouth, which had a large, sloping rear window. After watching the first part of a double feature, my parents would put me in the back of the car on a large shelf above the rear seat with that window over me. I would lay back there and look up at the stars and wonder about them. I knew that stars were suns. I also knew there was no air in outer space. I recall asking my dad, how is it possible for the stars and the sun to burn in outer space when there's no air? He didn't know. I had to figure that out. This led me to an early interest in astronomy. I was always a logical thinker. One time when we were on vacation at Lake Schaefer, we were accompanied by a priest friend, Father Paul Pyatt. He was the second of three Father Pauls who influenced my life. He was attempting to engage me in a conversation about how God made everything and influenced everything. Somehow in that conversation, he asked me, where does the wind come from? Presumably, he wanted me to say that God made the wind blow. My answer was, it's caused by the trees. Looking back on my answer, I still think it was a brilliant deduction. I had noticed that whenever the wind blew, the trees were moving back and forth. Naturally, I assumed it was the motion of the trees acting like giant fans that caused the wind. I later learned this was an example of that warning, correlation does not imply causation. I had noticed the correlation between tree movement and wind blowing. I simply had the cause and effect backwards. Still, I thought it was an ingenious observation for a young scientist. My scientific pursuits were furthered in the fifth grade under the guidance of a wonderful teacher, Mrs. Beatrice Rogers. She was a heavy-set African-American woman with a sparkling personality and a passion for teaching. We had all sorts of activities going on at once in her class. My favorite was a large diorama we built featuring dinosaurs made out of modeling clay. 
The fifth grade curriculum in 1965 was the first to implement the so-called new math. According to Wikipedia, new math was a revolutionary yet temporary paradigm shift in the way mathematics was taught in elementary school. The article says it was prompted in part by the Soviet Union launching the first man-made satellite, Sputnik, in 1957. The belief was that Russian engineers were mathematical geniuses, and in order to compete with them in the space race, we had to raise a new generation of people who were proficient in math. Rather than concentrate on rote memorization, the idea was to teach mathematical concepts. Kids needed to understand why math was the way it was and not just memorize answers. It was designed to teach logical thinking. Among the concepts included were Boolean logic, set theory, ideas such as intersection and union, as well as numbering systems in other than base 10. It might have contributed to my inability to do simple arithmetic I was talking about last week. While most students had no use for such concepts, I was unknowingly destined for a career in computer programming. It was natural for me. So not only did new math come to me easily, it served me well in later years. But ideas such as intersection and union served me well when working with 3D graphics and a graphics rendering engine I helped to develop. In 1990, I co-authored a book about computer graphics, and it relied on such concepts. I also use it in my work when I use CAD software for 3D printing. I wonder if new math would work better if they'd phased it in from first grade onwards, rather than trying to implement it system-wide and trying to teach it to fifth or sixth grade students who already had four or more years of the old math education. Given that children are learning coding at an early age, my guess is that many of the old new math concepts are being taught today without the negative connotation that became associated with that phrase and its sudden ill-conceived implementation in the 1960s. The major event that happened in fifth grade was I was given the use of a motorized wheelchair. The chair had been donated to the school. A small brass engraved tag on the side said, in loving memory of my husband, Mrs. Vern Hollingsworth. And there was a date, presumably, when Mr. Hollingsworth died. I heard he was a wealthy elderly man who had purchased a wheelchair but only used it for about six months before he passed away. The school allowed me to use the chair in school, and I could take it home over the summer, as long as my parents agreed to keep up the maintenance. I'll have more extensive comments about wheelchair technology in future episodes, but briefly, this was an ordinary Everston Jennings wheelchair with a pair of six-volt lead-acid automobile batteries and two electric motors that powered the rear wheels through belts and pulleys. The rear wheels had wire spokes and narrow, solid rubber tires. In the summertime, riding around on concrete sidewalks and streets caused excessive wear on the tires, and they had to be replaced quite often. Scraping through narrow doorways wreaked havoc on the thin wire spokes, and Dad eventually replaced them with heavy-duty spokes. That batteries had to be replaced about once a year, but they were standard 6-volt car batteries, which were still in common use in the mid-1960s. The electronics were quite primitive by modern standards of power wheelchairs. The joystick was a simple plastic knob that rested inside four micro-switches set at 45-degree angles. When you pushed the stick straight forward, it would press two of the switches, which would engage both motors 
forward. If you push diagonally, straight forward to the right, it will engage only the left motor, causing a turn. Push straight sideways, and one motor will go forwards, and the other will go backward. We we'll call that maneuver a bat turn, after the way the Batmobile could turn instantaneously in the 1960s TV version of Batman. Unlike modern power chairs, there was no proportional control. Each motor was either on or off. The physical therapist who taught me how to drive it had little or no experience with the device. She told me, if you get into trouble, just let go of the joystick and it'll stop. She unknowingly left out the word, eventually. When you let go, the chair would coast a tiny bit. And that was if it was on level ground. I didn't realize that on a ramp, it would roll down on its own without power. There were no brakes. My misadventures in the wheelchair began on day one when I ran over Miss Rogers' foot. After that, she learned to stay out of my way. My second thrilling moment in the power wheelchair came when I tried to drive it down a large ramp that connected the first and second floor classrooms. Now this episode's already too long, so I'm going to save that story for another episode. Let's just say my scientific mind learned a lot about physics, driving a wheelchair down a ramp out of control. I didn't have the only power wheelchair at the school. There were two others. Nancy and Leslie Gilson were about three years and five years ahead of me. The Gilson sisters were quite frail, petite young ladies with a soft voice that you had to strain to hear sometimes. They both had some sort of muscular dystrophy, although it wasn't the common Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, because only boys get that type. The family had purchased four power wheelchairs, two to use at school and another pair for use at home. The Gilsons didn't ride the school bus like the rest of us. Their chauffeur would lift them out of their home wheelchairs and put them in the limousine and drive them to school. Then he would lift them into the other power wheelchairs which were kept at the school. Now, we always said it was a chauffeur and a limousine, but none of us really knew that for a fact. It might have been their dad or older brother, or maybe just a friend of the family, driving what was obviously a fancy car, probably a Lincoln or a Cadillac, but not necessarily a limousine. Power wheelchairs in those days cost about $1,000 which in today's money would be about 30000 The fact that the family could afford four of them made it obvious they were well off. The presumed wealth of the Gilson family was an illustration of the diversity of the student body at Robert's school. On one end of the spectrum, we had the Gilsons, who could afford four power wheelchairs. On the other end of the spectrum, was one of my classmates who didn't come to school for a week because he had no shoes to wear. He needed expensive orthopedic shoes. When the social worker inquired why he wasn't in school and discovered the reason, the PTA paid for a new pair of shoes. The only reason I knew about it was my mom was president of the PTA and couldn't keep a secret. Robert's school had students who were black, white, Hispanic, and Asian, rich and poor, Catholic, Protestant, Jewish, and atheist. Disability knows nothing of race, creed, or socioeconomic status. While we were highly segregated from the rest of the city school population because of our disabilities, we were at the time the most integrated school in the city by all other measures. The prevailing belief that the Gilson family was well off was confirmed when Leslie sadly passed away shortly before graduating high school.
The family donated a large sum of money to buy hundreds of library books for the school. Each of them contained a foil sticker on the inside flyleaf saying, Donated in Memory of Leslie Gilson. Among the donated books were some sci-fi classics by Asimov and Clark, which I really enjoyed. Her family accepted her high school diploma posthumously. After the incident on the big ramp, even though I didn't know either of the sisters because they were older than me, I stopped Nancy in the hall one day and asked her advice on navigating the ramp. Now, Everest and Jennings dominated the wheelchair market in those days, and they were the only company to make power chairs. They only had one model. Even though my wheelchair was theoretically identical to those driven by the Gilson girls, for some reason, they were both faster than me. Now, we never officially raced, but I would find an opportunity to go down the hall alongside them, and I would always lose miserably. It made me really angry I could get outrun by a couple of girls. I never got to know Leslie at all. And Nancy was only a couple of years ahead of me, so we ended up in high school at the same time. I remember her as quite shy, yet very intelligent, with a good sense of humor. She won a poetry contest for a poem that really moved me. I got a copy of it around here somewhere, and if I ever find it, I'll reprint it and include it in the podcast. In an award-winning magazine article I wrote in 1987 about my school experiences, I told the story about the Gilson girls that was related to me by one of the teachers at the school reunion. Later, I got a nice note from their older brother thanking me for remembering them. He said he didn't recall the incident I described, how Nancy had handled the death of her older sister, yet he couldn't deny that it happened. For me, it doesn't matter if the story was true or not. It doesn't matter if they came to school on a chauffeur-driven limousine or if it was just their dad or their older brother in a fancy car. It's an example from that famous line from the film, The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, where they say, when the legend becomes fact, print the legend. The Gilson girls were the stuff of legends. In our next episode, we'll continue the saga of my days at Robert's school. I'll tell one more story from fifth grade and then move upstairs to the junior high. If you find this podcast educational, entertaining, enlightening, or even inspiring, consider sponsoring me on Patreon for just $5 a month. You'll get early access to the podcast and any other benefits I might come up with down the road. It's not that I'm desperate for money, but a little extra income always helps. My deepest thanks to my Patreon supporters. Your support means more to me than words can express. Even if you can't provide financial support, please, please, please post links on social media so I can grow my audience. That's all for now. I'll see you next week when we continue contemplating life. Fly safe, everyone.